Okay, very good morning. It is Tuesday 24th of March. I hope everyone is doing well and I hope everyone is safe and sound. Um, definitely a few things for me to get you up to speed on uh, from the overnight close on Wall Street being positive, overnight a uh, positive Asia Pacific session leading on to a, a fairly uh, positive start to proceedings, at least from an equity point of view this morning. Uh, so if I just quickly flick over my screens and give you an overview, uh, DAX up about 500 points at the moment, just short of its R1 here in the center left, as you can see in the futures market. Uh, the Dow up about 800, the S&P up a just shy of 100, so consequently T notes down about 15 ticks, but gold remains elevated. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, it's trading close now to the $1,600 level and gold futures hugging that R1 for the time being. Uh, in the currency markets, the dollar remains uh, suppressed following the Fed announcement from yesterday. So Dixie still down about a percent, and that's helping both major pairs uh, breathe a bit of a sigh of relief in terms of the euro on the top left and sterling dollar cable in the center up about 130 this morning uh, and helping see quite a significant bounce from obviously those super depressed levels we were trading at just a short while ago. Uh, I was remember this last week when Sam and I were sat in the office and we couldn't quite believe it when we started to break through 116 and we saw that eventual low here just short or just below the 115 handle but uh, you can see we had that retest yesterday and we bounced quite firmly off there at the moment and interestingly uh, and I'll give you my points or my view on this in a in a second but the pound really quite unresponsive to the lockdown now put into place by the UK government I'm sure you saw the Prime Minister's national address last night uh, but as I said, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, otherwise, elsewhere, with some of the slight risk kind of optimism, if you like, from that perspective, uh, equities higher, oil also higher. Uh, the two tend to trade a little bit in tandem at the moment from a correlation point of view, just given the natural tie to economic prospects uh, with the virus being at the forefront of investors' attention. So here, crude as well, likewise, coming off a, a strong bounce from these these kind of key levels which we've already been looking at for a while um, that breach which took us down toward nearly the lows of, of 9-11 going back into the late part of 2001 uh, but we've managed to see a pretty decent recovery uh, at this point yeah oil trading high I still I still feel um, directionally more bearish than I do bullish from this perspective because this isn't just about a demand issue which I think central banks and governments can do to, to, to um, almost try to counteract the downturn by doing stimulus and uh, by cutting rates and doing other monetary policies that we've seen from the Fed for example but there's supply as well and that's the issue here uh, Russia and Saudi still really not a lot forthcoming uh, in regards to details about any type of deal being made and for the moment then uh, I still feel quite quite bearish on prices, so I, I'm still reluctant to really short, uh, or sorry, go long at this point, despite the bounce. So here, just looking at WCI crude, it's finding a little bit of resistance at around the uh, initial Asia Pacific range high that we had, had a little bit of a test of that in the European morning. Uh, perhaps that provides a, a, a maybe a decent entry point because uh, you've got the the placement of the R1 sitting just above it. You know, do uh, could you? You know, be able to get in short at this point and then it was a stop just above and looking to pr uh, ride the move back down uh, and then I guess just scaling out of some of the move as we come down to these various different levels uh, that were defining because some of yesterday's range uh, perhaps could be a trade opportunity today um, let's just have a quick recap though of what the Fed said because one of the things was um, I think a lot had a couple of questions. What exactly has the Fed done? And I've tried to make this. I've I've written down a couple of notes here on my my screen to make it as simple as possible. And let me just flip over my screens. Um, talking about the Fed, then um, one of the things was uh, the Fed said they're going to buy an unlimited amount of uh, Treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities to keep borrowing costs low to alleviate any kind of funding stress. Uh, they basically did three different things when you look at it on a more granular type level. So. 
They're going to help large companies stay in operation by uh, providing a credit facility. They're going to keep loans available for households and businesses. And remember, this is what we said was really quite key. This isn't just for the United States, but this is for every economy. It's all well and good trying to give kind of blank paycheck of, say, $1,000 to a U.S. individual consumer. But at the end of the day, that's not going to last them very long if they lose their job. Uh, and then look, if companies go under, we're talking about unemployment levels that could rocket higher, like some of the numbers we've been seeing. Uh, Morgan Stanley, for example, looking at uh, an average unemployment rate in the coming months of just shy of 13%. And we've obviously got those jobless claims coming out. And Goldman's calling for that two and a quarter million number that we could see uh, on Thursday. So trying to address that, they've done this thing called a term asset backed securities loan facility of a mouthful but it's called a, a TALF and that was something I remember covering back in 2008 during the initial financial crisis because again just trying to take care of those smaller firms so they can still operate and, and, and function and employ people essentially. Um, and then Main Street lending program so this is more loans to small medium sized businesses so if you think about it you've got uh, help for large corporations in the form of, of credit facilities You've got uh, Main Street Lending Program, loans for smaller mid-sized businesses, and then you've got these um, keeping loans available for households and businesses. So you've got the kind of uh, the pyramid of levels there to try and keep the system functioning, keep people employed, which is really the key here. So this is what the Fed have done. And um, one thing is, if we look at the the chart yesterday, uh, I'm not sure if you guys managed to to join us, but me and the guys did a like a live online webinar, and what happened yesterday when the Fed made this announcement, this was the initial reaction, was this, this point here. We, we rocketed higher, but at the time, that was when we, we started the webinar, wanted to jump on a little bit early. Um, you know, if you did ever want to take part in any of those sessions, just make sure you uh, subscribe to this channel and you'll be alerted uh, as to when these things are happening, when links will go out uh, and so on, so make sure you do subscribe. Uh, but here, what we had was the uh, market initially spiked higher, but we were saying, well, you know, at the end of the day, we kind of knew that this was forthcoming. It's something I've been saying on the briefings a number of times is, you know, I do expect stimulus packages to go up. I do expect more coordinated action amongst European nations to increase. Uh, I do expect lockdowns to happen. Uh, and I do expect this, whatever it takes, literally uh, means that. And so here, I just thought, well, after the initial blip, I thought it was a little bit overdone, to be quite honest. Uh, and then the market did fade. And as we got through the um, open uh, on traditional kind of New York stock exchange trade, we kind of came lower. We did eventually grind it out during the Asia Pacific session. And net net, we are more positive this morning. But I think that was a little bit of an over initial reaction this kind of I guess the headline that was snapped on Bloomberg was unlimited QE and people jumped all over that but uh, I think rationale returned and it was more well, really you know this was fairly in fitting I think with with expectations of them you know fulfilling that commitment of which they've said so we came back down you can see there's a really solid floor of, of near-term support now that we've etched out on this chart in the S&P future uh, along this point of 21.73 and a quarter for the moment. So that's going to be a big level if we do come back down at any point in the near future. Um, let me get you up to speed then with a few other things. This was another uh, comment that I thought was particularly interesting. And this is really what's going to carry a little bit of the potential weight um, or the catalyst of whether or not we can go higher again or do we get a bit of reversal in equities. And you know the central banks are really doing... I think a pretty decent job, uh, but Congress now needs to do its job also. Remember, the monetary policy toolbox is relatively bare now. They've kind of uh, played a lot of their, their cards at this point, and now it's over to Congress. And for Congress now, this is the type of headline that you're, you're seeing at the moment, and this is Senate Democrats have blocked a $2 trillion stimulus bill for the second time. And so what's happening here is... The Democrats, they blocked it for a second time, insisting that legislation should include more stringent lines. So you know, this is one thing. I did see a comment from Donald Trump yesterday. Uh, he said, quote, uh, the U.S. was not built to shut down. Now, uh, I kind of uh, admire his bravado, but uh, I think he's kind of fighting an inevitable here. And he will pivot on that and he will have to shut down large areas. And what we're already starting to see in kind of densely populated areas like New York, 
where the number of confirmed corona cases is about 15 times higher there than it is in anywhere else in America, as you would imagine. Um, but here, Congress does need to act. You know, it's really important. One thing that you could say, and it's received a lot of positive, I would say, response in both markets and publicly, has been from Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor in the UK, because of you know going above and beyond, uh, in, and as a proportion of GDP, these massive packages that are coming forward. But now it's really down to the politicians on Capitol Hill. They've got to get this over the line now. Uh, and I think that's going to be quite a key catalyst on, on the kind of more medium term direction that we get in in markets. So that's something to, to definitely keep an eye on. But let's just have a quick run through and, uh, and look at the coronavirus update. So total confirmed cases you can see on the left now uh, just coming up to close to 400,000. Uh, the death toll at about 16,500. Uh, these numbers here I mean, Italy cases keep rising, but look how quickly America is now coming up here. Uh, third on the roster at 46,000. You know, quickly, and I do expect that number to go into the the hundreds of thousands. Let's not, um, you know, let's not pretend this isn't going to be the case. Unfortunately, it will. Um, and that then leads us on to a couple of interesting things or observations here. Uh, the thing I like about this FT chart is the way that they've done it is they're looking at the cumulative number of deaths by the number of days since the 10th death and what they're looking at here then is you can see these these dotted lines on various different trajectories if you like now the first one which is here is the most sharpest where exponential growth meaning that basically deaths are doubling every day now the closest to that actually is new york of all places so uh, in the united states of america followed then by places like Madrid, for example. Um, but then there's the, the, a slightly more shallow line, if you like, and then that's uh, a death, deaths double every two days, and then we go here every three days, and then here every week. Now, one of the interesting things here is if you look at Lombardia, so if you look at in Italy, where the key region in the northern part of the country, where it was the kind of epicenter of the non-Chinese outbreak in mainland Europe, Actually, Italian deaths have gone, um, have slowed for the second day. So this could be quite an interesting sign as well. I remember I've talked about this before, about monitoring these key geographic regions like Germany, France, Italy, the UK and the US predominantly. Uh, I do think that one thing that could be uh, interesting to, to watch, particularly because of the, the potential size of, of cases that could become apparent is India. It's only very early stages there, but I would expect that to come quite quickly uh, up, just given the, the nature of the, the, the structure and infrastructure of the country and, and how densely populated it is. So here, I would say there's a, there's a couple of things to be aware of, and, and that's particularly Italy. Uh, if the deaths do start to slow and we start to see similar things uh, in Spain, which does look a little bit more troubling in how quickly their cases are arising at the moment, but then the UK is going to be a key one because I think from a UK perspective, as we've seen here, we're now at 6,700, still relatively low. But again, I'd expect that to be in the probably in the tens of thousands by the time more people get tested uh, going forward. A um, few other things. We, of course, saw this chap speak last night. Um, and, you know, look, I'm no fan of, big fan of Boris Johnson, but I actually thought he did a, a relatively good job. I think he sounded quite assertive, quite authoritative. Um, he actually sounded quite serious, but quite genuine. Uh, and I think that's, you know, it's amazing when you think about it. We were sat in a press conference about a week ago, and he was talking about squashing the Sambrero, uh, referring to this kind of peak, if you like, where the NHS wouldn't have been able to uh, cope if they did this herd immunity approach by letting everyone get infected and squashing that down to have a lower distribution of cases. That's that joking Boris has gone out the window now and absolutely that's necessary given the gravity of the situation. So uh, the thing that he said obviously was all non-essential shops are shut and the police to enforce a stay at home order. So, you know, we did make that call yesterday. I don't think this is... Uh, unexpected the pound nothing has reacted to this because if anything we're a couple steps behind putting in these more strict measures than what we have seen from our european uh, partners deaths in the uk uh, claimed 335 lives 
as of Monday, a jump of about 15% to give you a bit of context. Um, now, this move from Boris has come because of basically a disregard of the government's request to self-isolate. I'm not sure if you have been out, but it, I mean, if you've seen the shots, I mean, London for its sins has pretty much just been going about its business as per usual. Uh, and so now police are going to be deployed. They're going to have the ability to break up kind of gatherings. So one thing I'd like to make clear, though, because I see a lot of misinformation on the Internet um, and social media. The government, if you listen to the speech, they're not saying you're not allowed to go out. You're not contained in your house and they're waiting for you the moment you step out. You are allowed to go out uh, for things like to go to the shop, but they're recommending just do it once a day. You are allowed to go out for a run or for some exercise once a day, but to be responsible. Uh, and that's the main thing. I just want to reiterate that. Um, it is a shared effort that the country's got to, got to do uh, from this point on. Um, this is going to be in place for the next three weeks, is what they were saying. Um, the other thing that's quite uh, a thing to monitor here is about Europe getting serious. Obviously, we've talked about this Italian slowdown in, in deaths, but here the Euro officials talk rescue plans to counter economic pain. Now, one thing we're going to see uh, in a short while, and I'm going to try and wrap this briefing up before it comes out, is the Eurozone PMI data. These are the flash readings for March. So this is where we get manufacturing and service PMI numbers coming out of France, Germany, the Eurozone, the UK later as well, uh, and also for the US this afternoon. And this is going to be particularly telling to see how the land lies now with how these, these purchasing managers are feeling. To give you a bit of a sense of what this is looking like, this is the German manufacturing PMI. And you can see the previous reading we had was surprisingly strong. However, the expectation for this reading is to go down to 39.6. So you can see here, you know, remember a number below 50 in the, the PMI is a contraction. So you can see pretty much for the entirety of 2019 and all of 2020, even though the number's been moving back higher, Germany has been in a heavy contraction in its manufacturing um, sector. Now, we know that it's been kind of a triple threat between either uncertainties around Brexit, the protectionist policy out of the US, and tariffs on things like the automotive uh, sector in Germany. Then you've got this kind of domestic ongoing struggles of the Angela Merkel kind of legacy government. Now you throw in the virus, and this is going to be you know, particularly catastrophic for an economy which exports goods like Germany. And so the number they're expecting today is for 39.6. Now, I'm going to have to put that on a 25-year chart to bring in the financial crisis so that we can see the last time we were down that low. You can see a number sub-40. Uh, you've got to go back down to when we were printing in the kind of low 30s in the depths of the financial crisis. So... Yeah, it's gonna. These numbers are gonna be pretty bad this morning. Uh, I just wonder how much impact that's gonna have on markets, given that that is broadly expected to be bad. Uh, but definitely keep an eye on the euro, keep an eye on the DAX, keep an eye on the Bund this morning when this data comes out. Again, we have France first, then Germany, then the eurozone, then the UK in that order. Um, starting the first release coming up uh, in around 8:15, uh, going through to the UK data at 9:30. Um, the other thing, just bouncing back here, that I wanted to mention from a news perspective, that, that comment I've got highlighted at the bottom of the screen, and I've just got some more notes here. German officials said yesterday that they're ready to help and are prepared to support an emergency loan from the euro area's bailout fund. Now, this has been a thing that people have been pushing for a number of weeks ago when this first started to unravel. Uh, as, a, as a narrative moving markets was about Germany really stumping up the fiscal measures. Now, we've seen that announced domestically, but now they're talking about more unified European action. And I think this is quite key um, for this to be successful, to counteract this economically in the Eurozone. Now, things that they've said here is Berlin would see Italy granted an enhanced credit line by what's called the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, and it with minimal conditionality. That's the key part, according to German officials close to the government's thinking. And Italy, with the support of France and Spain, is pushing the bloc to take a further step toward fiscal union by jointly issuing bonds for the first time in order to finance the virus stimulus program as well. So this idea of euro bonds, that's something that Germany has been highly resistant to. But again, does necessity rule and needs must, and we see these things, these are things that you could be looking out for as other measures to come forward uh, from, a, from a government's point of view to counteract this downturn. 
Um, so yeah, quite a few different things. Um, one thing for your calendar to be aware of, leaders of the G20 um, major economies, they're gonna convene for a video conference call on Thursday to discuss the coronavirus um, situation according to sources at the moment. So more comments I'm sure to come on, on, on that front throughout the week. Um, another thing to be aware of is China to lift the lockdown over the virus epicenter in Wuhan on the 8th of April. I do think this is quite important from a, a milestone point of view. Uh, transportation to resume in a city. Remember, this is a city that basically is bigger than London. And so you know, a real, you know, this is the apparent origination, the hot spot in the Hubei province. And if they reopen this, we're going to get the first time where really it becomes a degree of normality and does it then lead to a second phase of outbreak or not? Big question we're going to or China's going to face at this point. Uh, and that's going to be very interesting for markets if in the worst case scenario, they kind of um, unlock the key, everything goes back to normal, people go to work and we're talking about a, a large uh, city here in Wuhan, and then virus numbers, that flatlining in the Chinese curve starts to lift again, that's going to be so bad for market sentiment at that point, because it's going to show then people will get highly apprehensive about the lockdowns that we're doing now in UK and Europe. Are they even going to be enough? Boris said 12 weeks. Does that then become more like six months, eight months, nine months, 12 months? And if that does, all the more uh, problematic it's going to be for the economic prosperity of these nations. Um, going here, just going to have a look at gold quickly. Um, I thought I'd point this out because, again, during the webinar yesterday, we were talking about gold um, because the Fed had just made their announcement. We were making some observations about it. Uh, and I was giving a bit of running commentary at the time. And this was when the, the Fed announcement came out, it was around here, and we started moving higher in gold because obviously the, the dollar collapsed. And actually, we were looking at this kind of zone, this area here, 47 to 50 in the gold future, which was around the highs on the 17th, 18th on that kind of double top. And it you know, worked to treat. And at the time, we were kind of looking at a couple of things. We were suggesting, well, at this point, uh, you know, the Fed have have unleashed literally a bazooka in terms of how it's being referred to in the press which means like you know a massive another injection for the uh, for their policies in terms of what the market reaction can be and its, and its ability to assist these companies definitely in consumers in and how they operate and so we thought the dollar's going to get hit gold's going to go bid equities at the time this they'd already peaked and were fading so you had multiple reasons you know, and we were saying there's probably lesser risk of these margin now big shakeouts in markets. Typically, they tend to come at the end of the week, which makes some sense. Uh, but also as well, I think the, um, th those margin calls now are probably going to become fewer at this point. More volatility generally in equities has started to dissipate a little bit comparative to those wicked swings that we were seeing uh, just a few weeks ago or days ago, in fact. So uh, we felt quite bullish and gold has continued that push higher and we've now soldiered all the way back up to 1600. And as per the, um, the story I was just showing you, Goldman Sachs have come out and they see quite an inflection point after the sell-off. They're actually remaining quite, quite bullish at, uh, at this point going forward. Um, I'll leave Sam. Uh, Sam can't obviously join me on these briefings for the moment. Uh, but he's going to share some charts in Trading Live and on Twitter as well, so do do check that out. Okay, uh, final couple of words, and then I'll wrap things up. Uh, one is, uh, if you haven't ever before uh, heard of Amplify, obviously if you're watching this on YouTube and you don't subscribe to the channel, again, please do subscribe. We'd very much appreciate it, and we hope you find value from these kind of fundamental rundowns. Uh, I do it because I do think that it's quite an underserved area, in terms of how people cover markets generally on the internet. It tends to be quite heavy on the technicals. So hopefully this is uh, of assistance to you. But do check out AmplifyTrading.com. Um, when you go on our website, you basically get presented with some different options, depending on whether you're interested in our proprietary trading and trader development uh, programs, or whether you're a student looking to get a more holistic overview of markets and use our kind of proprietary financial markets simulation software. So if you're a student, click that one to find out more. If you're a trader, click that one to find out more. If you're a trader, this is the page that you'll see. You can get information about the course and this type of trainings that we do. 
Um, but if you click on that Start Now button within the online section, then you can basically get access to a free introductory video uh, from our managing director talking about trading volatility that he shot just about two weeks ago. Uh, so definitely do check that out. All of our training, just to be clear now, here's a quick overview um, of the uh, the general options. You've got the online, we have an e-learning portal, which is it's called Amplify Now, it's on demand. It's all pre-recorded content with uh, supplementary material and assessments. Uh, you get a professional qualification on the back of completing it. Uh, so it's kind of ready to pick up and go in that respect. It's all lessons filmed by me and the head of trading peers, Curran, who some of you might be familiar with. Uh, definitely worth checking out. The fact that, you know, gratefully, the, the feedback so far has been fantastic. Um, so just check out the website. And then for the um, our other, what would be traditionally in-house training, we're now taking that fully online for the foreseeable future, just given the situation that's ongoing. Uh, so again, do, do check out the website. All right, quick look at the calendar. What else have we got? So yeah, the PMIs are coming out shortly. Do keep an eye on these. I'm gonna come off the mic now. Uh, these are gonna be quite important. So you've got France coming up and all of these numbers, um, France is at 8.15, Germany 8.30, Eurozone 9, UK at 9.30, and they're all expected, as you can see here, to move into deep contractory territory as far as the PMI is concerned. Um, going into uh, the US afternoon, you get the same figures coming out from the States. Uh, you also get the API crude oil inventories as per normal uh, coming out as well a bit later on this evening. From a speaker's perspective, Feds Bullard, uh, non-voter, but you remember he was the guy looking at some crazy numbers for GDP to fall uh, by a spectacular amount. I think he was talking about 50% unemployment at 30%. Uh, he's a non-voter, uh, he, he does tend to be very opinionated as far as Fed members go, but he is speaking uh, a bit later on early afternoon, just so you're aware. And then for any US, uh, bond traders, you've got the two-year note auction kicking off the week's supply and $40 billion worth this evening. Uh, you've got a Schatz auction as well if you're looking at the uh, German rates as well. All right, that is it from me. I'm going to wish you uh, a good day ahead. Stay safe, uh, stay positive, and I will see you tomorrow. Leave any comments on the video, and I'll reply throughout the day. All right, thanks very much, guys.